Now, media relations, one of the most interesting aspects of public affairs. It's also one of the most challenging things a business can face. This is also an aspect of a crisis management situation which can prolong the crisis or end it sooner. It can increase its intensity. It can result in considerably more adverse impact or make the public affairs department into heroes. Well, it's generally agreed that the media relations errors greatly exacerbated widely reported crises such as Three Mile Island, the Challenger explosion, and Bhopal. However, in the Tylenol tampering's case, it was the communications initiatives which saved the product. Plants weren't retooled, chemists weren't hired to redesign the product. It was the early, effective, and repeated use of sound communication techniques which allowed Johnson & Johnson to recapture 98% of Tylenol's market. Some organizations feel they can be relatively silent during a crisis and wait it out. Experience shows this is not advisable, since it merely creates an information vacuum into which other groups will step. Thus, it is important for an organization to attempt to be the most accurate and reliable source of information during its own crisis. You don't want to be a bystander in your own crisis. Spokespeople must be available and the organization must be seen to be cooperative and active. The strengths and power of the mass news media must be recognized. While the news media arguably has its failings, no doubt, there is also no doubt that they help shape and direct public opinion. Researchers have shown that the major strength of the mass media is in the extremely rapid dissemination of information. For example, 90% of Americans knew about the Tylenol crisis within a week of its happening. However, it's also been shown that the media is ineffective at separating fact from perception or weeding out inaccuracies. This is why companies must actively participate in the information flow in a crisis. During a crisis, any affected company should ensure that all stakeholders, including the media, are regularly kept advised of the status of an incident. This should begin with an immediate acknowledgement that there is a problem and an articulation of the steps being taken to mitigate the problem. All communications and actions should be taken with the focus on the long-term interests of the stakeholders. Each direct contact with stakeholders or contact with the media should be viewed as an opportunity to transmit the message and enhance trust and rapport. The questions and needs of all stakeholders, including the media, should be anticipated and met in a timely fashion. During a crisis, controversy, or breaking story, the media will ask for, consume, collate, and disseminate more information at a higher rate of speed and more widely than public affairs managers could anticipate. It's important that the organization have a methodology to deal with this insatiable appetite and the attitude of the news media and the public that they serve. They deserve proper access and information and public affairs needs to meet that. It will be important to use charts, graphs, maps, status boards and other visual means of communication in briefing rooms to keep reporters up to date on as many facts as possible. Using the traditional six journalistic questions, who, what, when, where, why, how, there is a sample group of these in the workbook so that they will trigger some of your thoughts. Now, some of the questions present special legal predicaments. There should be no speculation on the exact cause of an incident, unless, of course, it's completely obvious. The same is true of liability and responsibility. Under most cases, these issues should never be addressed by anyone other than senior management on the advice of legal counsel. Answers to these questions can be quite complex. Care should also be taken in overly optimistic statements regarding remediation. A pre-prepared statement should be available for those at the site of an emergency to offer compensation to affected parties for out-of-pocket expenses without prejudicing the company's legal position. No purpose will be served during a crisis, controversy, or breaking story by questioning or lamenting why the media require as much information as they do as quickly as they do. If senior management agrees that the crisis will be prolonged by media and public attention, immediate media monitoring should be requested from a company which provides this service locally. Electronic coverage as well as public statements by politicians and others should be monitored and analyzed by an independent team on a regular basis to allow for a proper response strategy. This monitoring should include other significant stakeholders and their perceptions including telephone calls from customers and the public, suppliers, bankers and others.
So far, we've been talking about risk communication in general here in the top part of this funnel diagram. And remember, we said that risk communication techniques are used to handle both risk and crisis situations. But there are differences between a risk and a crisis situation, and this can affect how we communicate the situation. So let's take a closer look at the second tier of the funnel. Risk versus crisis communication. I imagine that some of you might be wondering, what's the difference between risk and crisis communication? Risk communication deals with things that might go wrong. Here we have a photo of a wildfire. A wildfire fire represents a risk situation. Crisis communication, on the other hand, deals with things that do go wrong. Here we have a photo of wildfire posing a direct risk to life and property. This is a crisis situation. Risk communication responds to any event that could cause public concern and could focus media attention on an organization or agency. Let's look at a couple of examples to explore this distinction. I've got two examples to share with you, one from the agricultural industry and one from natural resources. Let's say that you own a food processing facility. A food product sold by a competitor has been found to have salmonella and a food recall has been issued. Now, your product is free of salmonella, but regardless, you know that concern about salmonella is connected to this project generally and will affect your company, so you decide to take some steps. You initiate a toll-free telephone hotline, post information on your website, send out a tweet, and distribute information through various media to inform your consumers that your product is safe. This is a proactive approach. Because you act quickly, concern about your product is alleviated. You will probably suffer some economic loss, but because you responded quickly and in a way that enhances the public's trust, you are seen as a responsible company and will recover more quickly. Based on the information you've learned so far, do you think this is a situation describing risk or crisis communication? Let's look at another example. Your food processing company unknowingly shipped out salmonella tainted food. Within a short time, people around the country are getting sick and the cause has been traced to your company. You respond quickly to the media and the public's food safety concerns and in a way that addresses their concerns to maintain credibility and trust. Which do you think this situation describes, risk or crisis communication? If you guessed risk for the first and crisis for the second, pat yourself on the back, you got it right. Let's consider another pair of examples. Consider you are a state forestry agency and it's fire season. You currently have 100 active fires in the state and 45,000 acres burning. It has been dry and there's no rain in the forecast. There are no major fires threatening populated areas, but to keep the public informed and aware, you post wildfire preparedness information on your website, tweet the information out, ensure the online list of county burn bans is up to date, and run public service announcements on wildfire risk and safety. You've also responded to a reporter's request for an interview to discuss the current wildfires burning in the state. Based on the information you've learned so far, do you think this situation describes risk or crisis communication? Let's consider a second scenario. A fire has burned 10 homes and killed an elderly man who refused to evacuate. The 15,000 acre fire is 55% contained but is still threatening nearly a dozen homes. An evacuation order is still in effect for that area. Residents in a few nearby towns were allowed to return home earlier today when an evacuation order was lifted. The air quality in the area was deemed either hazardous or unhealthy by state officials. As a state forestry agency, you have been tweeting and posting on Facebook to alert the public to the evacuation orders and air quality concerns. Which do you think this situation describes? Risk or crisis communication? If you guessed risk for the first example and crisis for the second, great job, you got this one right. 